Hello and welcome to Almost 30. Hey everybody, it's Lindsay and Krista. Thanks for joining us. We know you have a lot of options out there, so we appreciate your listenership. And um, we're in New York. We're in New York, baby. We're in New York. So if you don't know, Krista and I live on opposite coasts and we make trips to record together, whether it's LA or New York or somewhere in the middle. And we're in... um, we're in a New York studio. That we're in a studio. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Not yeah. my favorite location. Yeah, the, the mean, studio is great. Not the my this where we are in New York is not my favorite. Yeah, we're in the butthole. We're in the butthole of New York. This is where I actually I used to live one block over and one block west. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that was the vibe. It was actually really scary. Like coming home at night, it was. Cause that's when I was bartending. Yeah, that is it's like not. And then I would spend money on a cab to get home because I didn't want to take a subway. I'm sure. Door to door. It's like, it was, I'm like, how am I supposed to save money and make money? And every time be safe, you leave, it's like Uh $600. (laughs) (laughs) I remember that we'd go on dates when I lived in Long Island City and we'd be like, let's cab home. And it'd be like $70. Crazy. And we're like, okay, we just spent $200 on dinner, Mm -hmm. 70 on a cab. How are we doing this? Uh Uh-huh. I remember my thing was like, just one day I went to Trader Joe's and Trader Joe's was in Chelsea and we were in Long Island City. And I kept waiting for the Q train or something. And I waited for a train that didn't run on weekends for an hour. I was at the fucking station and I had my Trader Joe's bags and I was like, yo, I can't be doing this. It was like, it was like, I spent like four hours on a Sunday going to fucking Trader Joe's. I was like, this is just not my vibe. I'm good on all that. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back into the city for recording the last few days, I'm like, I'm so glad I live in Dude, Brooklyn. honestly. <laughs> also, the plastic game. Mm-hmm. The amount of drinks and plastic and like is is wild. Yeah. I think it's because it's in a condensed place. You really exactly. see it. I feel like plastic's probably everywhere. I know. Yeah. I also don't understand how cups are like, I'm made of plants. And it's like literally plastic. <laughs> Have you ever seen those? <laughs> yeah. Like I got a juice press and it was like, I'm 100% made of plants. I'm like, what? Plastic, like the plastic plant? Yeah, I was like, is, plant, is plastic a Rather? plant? <laughs> like, how is this even possible? But yeah, I was in my, I think I told you yesterday, we were in this area. And I was like sitting, waiting for my lift. And I was like texting on the side. This girl's like, stop looking at your phone. I was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, literally like took one second. I was Dude, back to back. like my high school Krista self. It's kind of in, fun. It's fun. I was like, I'm a spiritual leader and I'm telling this woman to shut the fuck up. And mind your own business. <laughs> because it was like, it's so weird because that is like a side of me that was such a high school part of me. Mm-hmm. Where if anyone would even, co- even in COVID, anyone talk shit to me, something happens. And I just flip a switch. Yeah. And I'm like, don't talk shit to me. Yeah. I I told, I have those moments, especially with just like unnecessary. Yes. Um, like it's 2022, babe. Honking or like fuck yelling. Like there was yelling. a, I was on the subway the other week and these two people, a man and a woman were going at it from afar and just yelling across the subway car. It got really fucking What were they yelling about? Mean. It got really mean. Oh. Basically, the man sat down and it was like the only seat open and she was still standing. But then he got up and moved and let her sit. But she was annoyed that he sat in the first place. So she would not let up. So she was oh. she was like really, yeah, it was really sad because you could tell how like, yeah, her people, her people. So she was just being like, for sure. You're, yeah, you're the, like calling him all these things that, you know, he wasn't, he's like. It was just a wild Horrible. thing where I was like, wow, like they're probably walking away exhausted yeah. and just like the fact that you can even drum up that yeah. type of energy yeah, towards yeah, someone yeah. else that you don't even know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, there must be so much going on. So I had like sympathy, but then I was also pissed. Yeah. I'm like, you really, you like drummed up something in yeah. everyone on this fucking car. Yeah. I was yesterday on my walk home, there was an accident between delivery, mo- like delivery mopeds, Vespas, yeah. motorcycles, yeah. motorbikes. Mm-hmm. There was like three of them and then a car and then a cab. And they had all gotten in an accident. Mm-hmm. No one was hurt. It was very light. Like there was just, but they were all freaking the fuck out. Like they were all just walking it. Like the guy got in the cab, was yelling at the cab driver. It was like, it was insane. And when I was walking by, I'm like, none of this energy 
is attaching to me. I know, same. I'm living in peace. I am sending them love. But it's weird. Like, that's what's so weird about the city is, like, you're just— and I don't even know what it is, but you have to sort of detach. Bubble yourself. Bubble yourself and detach from everything. Yeah. Because it's like, I'm trying to think being here. I'm like, I think I feel less present. And I think that's like, it's very obvious. It's not actually profound, but it's like, because mm-hmm. I can't really be with so many people around, looking around, someone that's empathetic and intu- intuitive. It's like, you can't really yeah. be in that mode. Mm-hmm. Like even I was telling you at Barry's, I did Barry's and I was a zombie. Everyone was a zombie. <laughs> we're all like in, we're all in line for the in weights. a red light, you're like. Really, literally, I'm like, I'm looking down. I'm just like doing the motions. I don't feel my body at all. 100%. Wild. I, that's how I feel in some of those classes though, where I'm like, am I, like I have to remind myself being like, clench your, mu-, like yes. engage your muscles. That's what I did today. I was yes. like, you can do it. <laughs> Literally. I was telling myself, I'm like, this would be more effective if you fl- if you thought about the muscle. <laughs> like, I was like, how about you think about the row? <laughs> or like, think about the thing. And I was like, let's try mind-body connection for a moment. <laughs> Instead of literally just like doing this whole thing. Dude, I know. But Barry's is a wild time. I mean, it's a place to be seen. I like go into the lobby. I'm totally. Like, I'm like, my hair's coming out to side. Yes. I'm just like a hillbilly in, in fucking Barry's. Too much. Um, but people go to be seen and hook up and get picked up for sure. Yeah, it's a very like sexy moment. Yes. Like a very, I think it's the red light. It's it's just like a very, a very sexy thing. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, it's been nice to be here though. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but even with LA, I was telling, who was I telling? I'm like, I was, we were talking to Rupee. Yeah. Who was on the podcast. And I was like, we were talking about it like she's moving, which I'm excited about, but. Cool. I was like, I'm trying not to make talking shit about LA my personality so that I'm not always saying, LA, it's just the energy is so whenever. <laughs> so that I'm not, like, you don't want to do that. I know. Where you about live. any place, really. Any place, yeah. especially where you live. Yeah. You don't want to be hating on where you live because mm-hmm. it's like, what are you doing there mm-hmm. then? Like, shut up. Mm-hmm. I think every place, and I really, I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, like, if I'm good... I'm usually good where I'm at. Facts. Do you know what I mean? Wherever you go, like, there you are. Granted, if I live on 37th between 8th and 9th again, I don't know if I'd I can't be good, believe that. But I, I do. Like, I really think that if you are, you know, there's harmony within yourself mm-hmm. and you're feeling, feeling good. So you think I know. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Less than harmonious, <laughs> not no, feeling LA, good. LA is, you know, it's, no, it's true. It's definitely a. Uh, I don't know what it, it's I, an interesting thing. I think I'm yeah, I think I want more nature, but there is nature. For sure. But well, once you once you experience a place in, like even I saw you at Lacey's the other day. Yeah. Even farm. when you experience like something like that where you're like, it's wild. This is possible. She has two donkeys. I know, so sweet. <laughs> it's the best. Dude, I love donkeys. It's, and her kittens. There's oh my it was my heaven on earth. She's like, the kittens just got fixed. I'm like, there's kittens now. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? She has one tortie that is like a little hunter mm-hmm. cat. The two kittens, the two donkeys, and then the four dogs. And it's, they're getting llamas. Because what happens with any like farm type yeah. environment is once you get something, you need something else. Yeah. So it's like they got the dogs and the cats. Now they need to protect from coyotes. Donkeys protect from coyotes. Wow. So you get the cats for the mice and the rats. Then you need to get the donkeys to protect from coyotes. Then donkeys do really well with like, you know, all these other things. So you like, they're getting chickens too. So you have to like create the ecosystem of like your wow. your land. It's wild. Wow. I literally had my car and I almost drove off the cliff. <laughs> her, her like, a, her assistant had to like come out and like help me because my wheel was literally off the cliff. I had seven miles left on my Tesla. Almost like, Oh my God. Justin uh, Justin messaged me. He was like, coming down to the wire, huh? Because I was like 20 miles from a station with seven miles. No. Car was off the cliff. <laughs> I'm like, Were I'm not made gliding? for the country. It's just a hard, her her farm is like a hard turn, or her house yeah. is like a hard turn. And I know it. it's like my worst nightmare getting up there. And I'm just not the best, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm just not the best driver. I usually drive. So her, her assistant had to like put place rocks under so I could like get a grip. It was hilarious. Oh my <laughs> god! Like, Yo, no, thank you. 
Um, but yeah, once you've experienced that, you're like, oh yeah, I could have yes. a little more nature. Yes, yeah, a little more nature where you're just there's a little more totally in it. Yeah. Um, but while we were in New York, you know, this trip, it was so nice. We got to meet Jordana from mm-hmm. Betches, which was awesome. I mean, seeing the studio was so inspiring. What they've done is so crazy. It's the wildest thing. They've been doing this for 11 years. They started, they are three best friends. They started in college, like kind of started it to just capture kind of the Mm -hmm. relatable and ridiculous of their college life. Um, Definitely like this bubble, but they just, they're like, whatever, let's just Mm -hmm. kind of make fun of it and and parody it. And then it blew up. That just blew up and it's become a media company, mm-hmm. like they're total moguls. What's a mogul? But I think it's they're moguls. They're moguls. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah, yeah mogul. Yes. Um, and she's just so cool. And mm-hmm. it's really cool to like track that evolution and, and what it's really taken as a trio. Mm-hmm. We're a duo. They're a trio. Could never do a trio. The triangulation is uh, wild. See, everyone's talking about me. Yeah. Everyone hates me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be okay. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a lot. It's interesting that because it's it's interesting because I think doing it alone would be hard. Mm. There'd be a benefit to doing things alone, but it would actually be so hard because mm-hmm. it's like who would I? I would really need my therapist more than once a week. Yeah, like, <laughs> because You're like, what do you think of this episode title? Yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. <laughs> literally. Our therapy sessions are just like <laughs> checklists, um, but it's just there's so much that goes on being an entrepreneur. The highs and the lows. Like we always meet each other. If I'm down, you're up. Like, it's just Mm -hmm. that and to have someone that knows everything. Even when I was at my corporate jobs, when I didn't like them or if I liked them, to have someone understand the environment and the nuances of your corporate job and the Mm. relationships in it is so important. Soul cycle. Or, you know, any jobs that you worked at. Bartending. Bartending Bartending was a whole social Mm -hmm. experiment. I mean, there's so many characters within that. So having someone that really understands everything is so important. So whether it's you do, I don't know if, I don't know what's best, you know, three, two, or one, but it is so impressive what they've done and what they've built and just the creativity and the thoughtfulness of it all. All the podcasts they have are incredible. Bitches Brides, You Up, they have their new um, alcohol brand, Faux Pas, Mm -hmm. um, which is so smart in the way that they think about their audience. So I think what I learned from talking to her was to really use yourself as an example. It's like creating things for yourself and trusting that you represent a community of people that are also going to be interested in what you're doing Mm -hmm. and then serving that community with like deep loyalty and intention because I think they've really been clear about their mission and who they serve and they've continued to find creative ways to serve them. They also are very numbers and data driven. They are really, really mindful about numbers and data and analytics. And I think as women... Sometimes I'll see with women that we coach or work with, it's like numbers aren't everyone's favorite. Numbers can be scary. So there's a balance. But I do think that if you are going to be successful in business, numbers are an important gauge of things and can be really helpful for you to use. So I really found that to be um, really incredible. And then it's following your joy. Mm. Like something that just comes as a creative idea you have no expectation about. You just are doing this because you love it. And then following that the entire time through. Mm-hmm. And I loved like her approach to feedback where, you yeah. know, we're not people that really read every review and do all the things. But she highlighted that, you know, if I'm getting a review yep. or feedback that's consistent, she's like, I take it as an opportunity to improve upon what I'm doing. You know, she's been doing her new podcast over sharing with her sister for a bit now. And she was like, yeah, I'm just like constantly improving. And thanks to like some people who share and are like, hey, and this, you know, it kind of helps her to pick out what's true and leave what's not. A hundred percent. Yeah. Couldn't do that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, just give me the gist. Yeah. It's so, it's so hard. It, it's, well, cause I think, you know, there's not like a really, it's rarely tactful. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's hard to I, take in. I think too, it's, if it's going to be tactful, email me. Yeah, email or DM. Email or DM so that I can I can make a change. Or or thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Instead of like a review where it's public to everyone and then yes. it, it distorts. Yes. You know. Because it's like if it's a review, then it feels final. Mm. You've decided that tactical 
response is what it is. Yes. But if you're actually interested in a change, it's like you got to email because then I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, we can do, you know, think about that. Yeah. We can say totally Also, it's less. not final. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can say less. <laughs> um, so we were also on oversharing. So you can listen to that now. Lindsay and I, we talked a lot about sacredness of being single. Mm-hmm. We talked about the single season. We did um, How Triggered, which is a fun segment. So it was really mm-hmm. fun to talk to Jordana and her sister, who was the therapist, who was so cool. Yes. Yeah, so, so cool. Thanks for having us at the Betches head quarters. Yeah. It was so fun to be in office. I fell on my face in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it was just a blast. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. If you mm-hmm. love this episode, be sure to share it, whether it's on IG or share it with a friend. We really appreciate your listenership always. And if you haven't heard, we have a new podcast. It's called Morning Microdose. It is Monday through Friday, every single day. And this is really to prime you, mind, body, and spirit for the day ahead. It's five to 10, maybe 12 minutes at the most. And these are vortex moments from the Almost 30 podcast moments that we hope to inspire. We hope to get you curious, excited, make you laugh. um, And we're really proud of it. Yeah, I'm so excited. Love you guys. Almost 30 podcast on TikTok. Almost 30 podcast on Instagram. Almost 30.com. I'm on Instagram at it's Krista. And I'm at Lindsay Simsick. And we will see you on the other side. Bye. Bye. Oh, man. So I am dealing with a little bit of a cold. And I'm so thankful I have my propolis spray from Beekeepers Naturals. This is an all-natural immune booster. Uh, It has propolis in it, which comes from the beehive, baby. Uh, We've interviewed Carly Stein from Beekeepers Naturals, and she has really brought in the power of the hive into the brand Beekeepers. Propolis, for example, is antiviral, antifungal, antimicrobial, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory. It's basically the ultimate body protector. It gets rid of sore throats. I've been spraying it in the back of my throat all day and I'm feeling a lot better. It prevents getting sick. It's 100% natural and it's made of a substance, like I said, from the hive. So the bees make this from plant and tree resins. And this is basically like their immune shield for the hive. Uh, There are zero sugars or additives in propolis spray. It's really easy for on the go. I bring it with me when I travel too. And I highly, highly recommend all of their products are so pure and clean. I love what they're doing at Beekeepers Naturals, really leveraging the power of the beehive for our optimal health. So check them out. I'm a huge fan. Beekeepersnaturals.com slash almost 30, and you're going to get 25% off your first order. That's B E E K E E P E R S N A T U R A L S dot com slash almost 30, or enter the code almost 30. You're going to get 25% off your first order. Beekeepers Naturals are also available at Target, Whole Foods, Sprouts, Air One, and GNC. So I'm really excited for you to start feeling better every single day, starting today with Beekeepers Naturals. Okay, so I'm getting married soon. I'm kind of keeping everything under wraps. It's just my style, but I wanted to share one thing I'm doing is taking my bouquet after the wedding And I am going to make it into a beautiful piece of art thanks to Pressed Bouquet Shop. Okay, so Krista did this and I was obsessed with it. I'm going to send my fresh bouquet right after I get married, probably the next day, over to them at Pressed Bouquet. And they're going to press this into a resin and make a beautiful tray with these gorgeous gold handles. Y'all, it's going to be stunning. I'll show you ASAP. But I just think this makes the best gift for a bride, for bride and groom. Uh, Even for the bridal party, you can take their bouquets and press them. It's unbelievable. Their ultimate goal is for you to just have your keepsake from your wedding in the most beautiful way. Their quality is unreal sustainable, made by humans, which is so nice. And the ordering process is super, super easy. And you'll get this to your door in a timely manner. Okay. That's what we're all about. Easy and timely. If you're a bride, you know. 
if you want to dry press bouquet, I highly recommend and you can get 10% off using the code almost 30 when you go to pressedbouquetshop.com. That's pressedbouquetshop.com. Use the code almost 30 for 10% off. Doing that many podcasts a week, do you ever get tired of it? Like how does that, how do you get the energy to do, do that? And also to be mm. camera ready. <laughs> This is my I thing. Know. I am crusty crust. I, I had makeup on for four days and I want to die. I know. Um, I totally feel that. Um, so not all of them are video recorded, which is a whole different ballgame. Really just um, You Up, which we do on Wednesdays, um, is a, a video. So that's great because I look like shit otherwise. Um, <laughs> but it's nice. It's actually like it would be, I think yes. it would be much more draining to have to get ready. We might start recording the At Betches podcast um, in person, which... Again, I, it's a trade-off. Everything's a trade-off. You have to mm -hmm. get ready, but then it's a different vibe in person. So I like that. Um, and I just make sure they're spread out over different days because I do think like if you're having a very good deep conversation, it does drain you. And also you can't have too much booked before that because then, you know, if you you show up and you've had a full tiring day, you're just not going to bring an interesting conversation to the table. So yeah, completely. Did you have to kind of learn that? Did you have like a contrasting season where you were doing way too much and just feeling like not your best when you would show up? I think especially because we're simultaneously running batches and um, me as like being a, a talent person on the podcast it was definitely a learning curve. <laughs> yeah. Why do we always like, like, you're like, you're like a talent person. Yeah, who like, are we? Yeah, talent, yeah, like, talent person. Um, <laughs> it's definitely kind of figuring all of that out. And I would say the pandemic actually helped really balance everything out because you had more control of your own schedule and you didn't necessarily have to go in. Um, and especially with my co-founders, I feel like our relationship has gotten so much better because we've had so much more space from each other. Like we used to, now we have our own offices in this office. But as I said, before we moved in here, we were in a smaller space and the three of us shared an office and we were oh, at wow. one basically like this, like we called it mega desk. Um, and we were together like all day. So it was a mix of, and we're also friends. So it was a mix of personal and business. And it was just, we were in the same room all day and it became a little suffocating. And then we'd be like, okay, we're having this discussion sort of argument about a business thing and then it's like oh it's 10 a.m we have to go record this podcast and the energy would be very weird so it's actually the pandemic has really helped us um be more grounded and control our schedules more to really optimize the day not necessarily filling it with more stuff but making us being able to focus and space things out and have our own you know solitude mm -hmm. there yeah for us when we were together in LA and it's like I was so inspired by being together that I'd be like, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And just like, we would both just be kind of building and continuing to add more and more. And by being on both coasts, it's been nice because it is like more space where you're like, okay, we can focus on what we need to do and not be like where I was just adding more and more and more things the whole time. Well, I have a question for you guys because I mean, obviously you're friends and you also run this show together. Do you ever... um you know, sometimes you have a business idea and I find this with my co-founders, my friends, where you're, where you're kind of like, all right, let me just, um, we're not like in, we're not so formal that I need to yes, wait until Monday morning to, to message you about this. Um, but then the other person just isn't in that space where they're, um, you know, I'm, I'm having a, I'm having a Sunday where I'm not thinking about anything <laughs> and I would prefer not to talk about that. Um, so I always think it's such an interesting conversation because it's with text messaging and you don't have to call someone, but you never really know if they're in that mode where they're ready to hear this idea or get into it. And so you can kind of feel shut down by the other person if they're less responsive or less like mm -hmm. giving you less energy, but it's really just because you're in a different mode than them. Totally. 100%. Totally. And I think we've kind of had to learn that like over the years where like in the beginning, you know, from like the early, early days, I mean, it would be all day, every day of just right. kind of back and forth, kind of, whether I was talking through text and then eventually we went to Slack, but we would also still do text and we, you know, be in person. And so some of the ideas were coming through so quickly that we wouldn't be able to catch them in a way that felt super grounded. And so we would either lose them or it would lose steam. And then that would kind of build frustration because we're like, oh shit, we said we were going to do that. So I think now, thankfully, and I'm, I know you do too, it's like we have these systems to catch the ideas when they come through and 
it's been really good for Krista and I to kind of have, you know, Slack, for example, as a place where we are sharing ideas for the podcast rather than through text. Text is mostly right. like personal and our friendship. Um, though like when we're together and we're like going on walks and things like we'll have ideas and we'll kind of brainstorm that way and catch them in that way. But um yeah, there has to be some sort of structure, even though you're friends, even though right. you have that history. Like it's, it feels a little like cold and, you know, sterile, but it's so necessary in order to like preserve the friendship. Yeah. You know, I used to feel like when I'd get an idea, it was like, it was like a hot potato. Like I was so like, I had anxiety not doing it like right. now. So it's like, I have to, I had to really over the years, like, let the idea land and sit with it instead of like like driving my team on like wild goose chases all the time where they're like, we literally just did this thing and now you want us to do this thing. Please God, chill out. And so now I do Slack schedule message. Do you do that? No, I didn't even know you could schedule messages uh -huh. on Slack. It's the best. So every weekend when I'm working, I'll do like, not every weekend, but just when I'm working off hours, I'll do schedule messages. And then I'll also Google uh, schedule emails. So I'll never send any emails or not never. I don't often send things on weekends just for team. And so I feel good because it's off my chest. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I did the thing. I said the thing. I did the idea. But then it's hitting their inbox at like a different time. So I'll do that because I don't want to continue to be overwhelming people. But there is that moment where you share an idea you're excited about. And they're like, yeah, that's good. And you're like, what? <laughs> you're like this idea is incredible <laughs> like what is the thing but you have more than one person so that's a little harder of a dynamic because you're not looking for it's like you're looking for validation for more than one person right it's a little hard how have you managed but at that? least you can just get one hopefully yeah 100 yeah. 100 it's I, like find yeah. the one person yeah i mean a three-person dynamic is definitely um a little bit more complex yes. i guess because it's my nightmare actually Right. You can feel isolating uh -huh. if, the it's two, like a triangulation. if two people are on the same page and 100%. you're not. Um, and a lot of that is about learning to communicate with each other. And, you know, we've at this point we've been doing this 11 years. And so in the beginning, I think it was definitely a little bit more, it could be more tense or it could be more, it could feel more isolating if you weren't on the same page. But, you know, as we've gotten older, I think, and as we've gotten more mature and as we've, we've actually had, um, you know, a, a, executive coaching just about like the way we communicate with each other because it is I'm sure you guys know this and you got just got married but it's like a, another marriage yes um when you're running a business with someone it can feel like there's all the emotional stuff and then there's so much it's almost bigger than a marriage because there's so much more on the line um it's not just your personal life it's your finances it's all that other stuff um so it can get um it can get weird but I think it's it's uh it's it's the kind of thing just like if you went to uh, relationship counseling, you get closer if you work through that stuff instead of avoiding it or resenting someone and having all that stuff build up. Totally. Yeah, that's what I've realized a lot is like trust in relationships is built not just by knowing each other for a long time or being in friendship for a long time, but it's like through the times where you are like there could be something and then you're like, no, we're actually going to work through this or we're actually going to have the conversation. I'm going to say the thing, you're going to say the thing, or we're actually going to have an awkward moment and then sort of get through it and move to the other side. And it's been huge for us. But for you, I mean, I've always been so curious. Like, I'm so impressed with your business and how serious you take things. It's like you guys are so not serious, but yet you do take business seriously because getting an executive coach is something that not everyone does. And we have had coaches for a long time. What I think what was the beginning for you guys? Like, what did the beginning look like? Because from what I know, it was like you guys being your very authentic selves and then it's transitioned to this. So mm -hmm. can you talk about the beginning of Betches? Sure. Um, so Betches started when we were in college in our, our college apartment. The three of us lived together um, and we were just kind of messing around a little bit. Like we were, I think we lived in such a bubble of a world and we kind of wanted to make fun of it. We kind of wanted to make sense of it. But we didn't want to be like haters doing a, you know, intellectual critique of what was going on. So we were like, let's just parody in it. Let's parody it. Um, let's just dig in mm. further and sort of make fun of it by exaggerating it. Um, and that's where the blog was really born. It was really just looking at all the things we were doing in college, of sororities and a lot of like binge drinking and the way your friend dynamic worked and the way that we were dating at the time and saying, 
this is sort of absurd. Let's, you know, dig in deeper. Let's make, create a caricature, which is really what like the Betch was at the time. Um, and let's go with that. And I think we thought it would just be relatable to us and our immediate friend group, but it turned out, and again, at that point, this was 2011. So we put it on one person's Facebook wall and it went kind of viral for there, from there, which is just so funny. The idea of even posting on your friend's Facebook wall, <laughs> which is very 2011. 100%. Um, and it really just took off from there. And I think we, obviously we did not start it as a business. We were in college, 21, um, not thinking about it like that. But then as it started to take off, we were like, okay, this seems kind of more interesting than getting a desk job. Um, and we had nothing to lose. We were so young. Um, so we figured why not? dig deeper into it. And we had an agent who helped us write a book proposal. And it's just funny being 21 at the time, thinking, you know, everything, I know. Mm -hmm. especially, you know, if someone gives you a book deal at, at 21, you're like, wow, I really do know everything. <laughs> I'm so ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, I always um, talk about in high school, I remember being a senior of high in high school. And I was like, looking around, I'm like, what else is there to know about uh -huh. life? <laughs> I, got it. I literally was Surely. like, I'm confident. I know what I want. What else is there to know? <laughs> like, no idea. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, that's sort of the false confidence that we started a lot of this with, which is probably good because it got us through um, the first few years of, of, of just continuing to create content and believing in what we were doing. But I think a lot of that was immaturity too. And as we got old, it's funny because we really grew up with this business. So we started so young and I feel like We've grown up with our audience too. A lot of our audience is, was with us in college. And now they're, you know, they're getting married, they're having babies. And it's just very interesting to see the maturity of our content in addition to just us growing up like the three of us individually, but next to each other. Mm. Yeah. The Were you ever afraid to kind of let the content evolve as you guys evolve? Just like thinking about the relevancy and like, making a change based on your experience, but being afraid that people would be like, wait, this isn't Betches anymore. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I think what we we have maintained is that that sense of realness, which we started with, I think it's just a little bit more thoughtful. Um, I think it was also a different time. And a lot of like when we started Betches and there was a lot, the internet was a little bit more, unregulated or, mm -hmm. yes. you know, it, it's, it was, yeah. Yeah. Like what you could say was, it was like more acceptable to say the things you would say to your friends behind the scenes mm -hmm. yes. in public and you weren't, and you knew your friends were kidding or you knew that it wasn't serious or you knew that this was how you talked mm -hmm. or it was joking. It wasn't like, it was, you know, people like no one I knew was saying anything ridiculous or horrible, but there was that freedom you really had. Mm -hmm. where it was smaller scale, only your community was really looking or watching you. And so you could have the freedom of an understanding of like, okay, we're all sort of cut from this cloth. We all kind of understand that this is how we joke. And you can be more free to express yourself. Exactly. I think that was, that was the case. And then as we're getting, but we had this again, normally, I think at that age, you really only have the bubble around you, but because we had this website and then Instagram was starting and then we had all this, these other ways to reach a huge amount of people. And as we got older, we were kind of like, all right, so let's re-examine the things we're saying. Some of it might be considered, you know, we need to be more thoughtful about what we're saying. Yeah. And we need to say it in a way that is actually helping people connect instead of, you know, we want to keep the humor, but we want to keep the humor and have it connect people instead of maybe isolating some or... We just wanted to be more careful, I think, with, with what we were saying and how we were saying it, which is really how a lot of the content evolved. And I think it's re still really funny and it still um, speaks very truthfully to our audience, but it does so in a way that I think is more mature just because that's how we speak to each other in a way that is very different than the way we spoke to each other, the way we evaluated our world at 21, um, now at 32, 33, uh, just a different outlook. And you all were obviously creating the content from the beginning, but at what point did you start to build a team or outsource? Like, how did that transition go? Sure. Um, so we had our first, we were working out of a, I'm trying to think how to find this. 
Um, so based, when we started, we were all working from our own homes and we're actually from the same town on Long Island. Um, and then eventually we wanted to expand. We weren't really making a ton of money in the beginning and not really sure how to monetize it. And so I had a bunch of odd jobs. I was, you know, babysitting. I was doing research studies. I was doing whatever I could to piece together <laughs> um, my rent eventually because I really wanted to get out of my mom's house. And then eventually... Um, we wound up making enough money and Instagram was starting to get big at that time. And we really had gotten on there pretty early. And I think we're cultivating a voice pretty early. Um, then eventually we made enough money where we were able to, uh, have a WeWork, which was a great starter, uh, situation for us. Mm -hmm. Cause you could rent a room and you could do it by the month. So it seemed less scary. You didn't have to pay for a whole year's office space. Um, and we got our first employee, I think it was, um, around 2014. It was just one one employee and she was helping with the shop and she was helping with a bunch of other things. Um, and then we slowly, slowly started to grow from there. Um, and now I think we have about like 45 employees. Sean, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> yes. it's like I love them all. Yes. <laughs> You're like, I love and care for them all. Okay. So it went from book to the mm -hmm. shop, right? We had the book and then the Instagram and okay. and then and monetizing the shop, yeah. from the, with the Instagram through partnerships through a lot of partnerships. Okay, um, yeah, we had a we had a company again at that point was outsourced um, that would help us, you know, on the selling side would mm -hmm. help us sell those those posts and the website. Um, and then also again, we were working on the books at the time too and the shop. And were you? What was the division of roles like? How did that work for the three of you? within the business, how did you determine who was doing what and how did you guys decide what was the right next step for you? That was a whole process in itself. And I'm sure, again, if you got you guys working together and um, running this podcast in this community, no, it's when you, st when you work, especially when you start working with a friend, it's a little confusing. And for us, especially because we didn't start out trying to start a business, we were just, again, having fun it became, that was one of the hardest things we had to figure out. Like who's good at what, who can figure, and also you're so young, so you don't really even know what you're good at because um, you haven't had any other previous yeah. jobs before. So I think we started off all doing everything. We would all, it's funny, every article we would all edit. Be like one person, you send it to the next person, they send it to the next person, just like extremely inefficient. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we would, we would all try to do everything because we also didn't want to miss anything. You were so, yeah. it's, it's the beginning and you want to make sure you're involved in everything and you're not left out. And also there's three of us. So it couldn't be like the two of you went to this meeting and I didn't go. Um, so there was a lot of feeling of, you know, wanting to, everyone wanting to do everything. But as we got older and again, we matured and I think we started to realize what parts of the business we were good at. Um, that's when we were able to start dividing. And again, also once we started trusting each other and our friendship matured and like our relationship matured and we were like, because part of dividing tasks or labor or responsibilities is trusting that the other person is going to do it in a way that you respect and that you, even if it's not the exact way that you would do it, that you trust them to make it good or to have this conversation without you. Um, and that was a big learning curve for us. But I think once we got over that hump, everything ran a little bit more smoothly. Mm -hmm. How did you know, did, were you super clear and confident in what your genius was or did you have to like figure that out? I'm still not. Sorry. <laughs> 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 well, it's funny. I feel like podcast, once we got into podcasting and I think we had our first podcast in 2016, I was like, something feels really good about this. Something about this medium or again, and it's funny because how, how it all comes back full circle to what were we doing in the beginning? We were trying to explain the world around us. We were trying to figure it out, um, trying to have a story that makes sense or even just explore why we do the things we do. And podcasting just wound up being just the best medium for that because you can really get into a real deep, nuanced conversation. Um, and I remember I was running the Instagram for a while, but it didn't feel... And again, I think the content was great and super funny and super relatable. And that helped connect the community and connect people um, in ways of friendship, which is always what we've tried to do. But once podcasting came around, it was just like a whole different, deeper medium for communicating. And I just was very drawn to that. 
Um, yeah, what would you say? I even think about this. Like, what do you think makes a good podcaster? Because a lot of people listening, either they have a podcast or want to start a podcast. And it's, yeah, it's such an interesting thing because people think it's just talking. Right. And it kind of, and it is, but it's not. So what would you say makes someone a good podcaster? Well, I think a lot of the time it's about the 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 two. If there's more than one host, I think it's about the dynamic of the host. And I think people, it's almost underrated yes. how important that is, the way that they connect with each other, the vibe that they have. If, is, is there an ease? Is there, do you feel safe to be able to get into those really deep conversations? I think a lot of people think, oh, I have a lot of stories. So... I should start a podcast, but it's so much more than stories because also eventually everyone runs out of stories. I think it's about the way you're thinking about things and the, you know, how a huge part of podcasting is how intimate you can get with the audience, how vulnerable you can be. And that's really hard. And I think that especially in such a public forum, a lot of people are not comfortable with them or they'll go there, but they won't really go there. They'll go kind of to a, a surface vulnerability. Yeah. Which it's like crass different. or like, it's like kind of sometimes people go like the sexual vulnerability of like sexual escapades or like drinking or mm -hmm. whatever. And there's such a different level. It's like that's vulnerable, but not like the vulnerable thing is the thing that you're kind of like, oh, this feels. Vulnerable thing is like why you're, yes, you're blocking out every we weekend. Go. Exactly. There yes. we go. Why? Exactly. Yes. underneath that? The normal thing is your dad issues <laughs> that you have to talk about. It is. It's like, I like the, with podcasting, it's like how it is powerful how someone's thinking about it. It's like providing a different perspective, bringing up something different, like mm -hmm. being able to be and think about things differently. But it is such a, it's the best medium. I just love it. It's so good. Same. And I mean, there's no, because it's also, there's no one cutting you off. There's no 15 second Instagram story cut off. There's yes. no, <laughs> um, and you can really go there, which yes. is just the best. And yeah. I think for, you know, your audience and community to have a place where they can go deeper with you. Cause when I, when I look at the brand, I don't necessarily see like the individuals that you are, right? Like right. I see, you know what I mean? I see mm -hmm. you, but um, I think it's important to kind of have those different ways in which people can connect with you. Did you, was there a point at which you were like, oh, like we have a community, like, mm -hmm. and did that kind of shift the way in which you were thinking about content or the way in which you were approaching the business or was it always just kind of a thing that you were aware of? I think in the beginning, it always, it did seem even in the beginning, there was a community of people who read the blog and they were like, this describes my life. And they didn't necessarily have a way to connect with each other, but they would, you know, comment on the website or something like that. Or, or then it became Instagram, became tagging your friends or sending your friends this meme, which gave you, which gave you just a sense of you. The, the perfect meme really describes the perfect feeling. Yeah. that you get from something. It's almost, and it seems so stupid, but it really That's describes, <laughs> you know what I mean? And something, and it's kind of like, if you get it, you get it. And I think Instagram has, has been able to connect people in that way where I can send you something and I can feel a connection just by you understanding um, how this feels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. And we've always really tried to do that through humor. And as we've evolved, I think podcasting is obviously such a way to form a community and the idea that they can connect via the Instagram of, um, of that podcast is something we try to do for all of our shows. And then when we launched faux pas, which I mean, is right behind you. Um, I'll have to give you guys some to, so to take cool. home. Uh, a lot, a large part of that was about the community. It was about, you know, how do we connect with our friends? Um, what are those moments, especially as you get older, I think you want to get a drink with your friend and or coffee if you don't drink um, or anything that you're doing. It's kind of those conversations like podcasting, but that are done on a micro level between friends and what are the conversations happening at our age um, and what do they revolve around? How do they change as we've gotten older? Um, and it's just really a way to kind of look at the world around you. A lot of the stuff feels really deep, feels really intense. And it's a way to, to not take yourself too seriously, be able to laugh at yourself um, and I think that's really what the brand continues to bring people. Obviously, like we said in the beginning, the content definitely has evolved. It's definitely gotten a little more mature. It's definitely gotten, well, some would say heavier, but I think it still keeps that lightness 
or that feeling of relatability and you can laugh at yourself. And although this is, a he- we take a heavy topic that's even like news and politics or dating for a lot of people um, or health and wellness, which feels so heavy, which feels so, uh, you know, hard to to get through. And we say, okay, we can laugh at it. We can laugh at ourselves. Um, and I think that's what people would, people are really drawn to when they interact with the brand in any of its forms. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Humor kind of creates that clarity sometimes where like if it's super heavy or super serious, you're like not able to like tap into how you really feel like, do you feel it's heavy and serious or do you feel kind of that desire for, for lightness? I wanted to ask about faux pas, like an idea like this, how do you decide what to bring into the world? Like I'm, there's, I can imagine so many ideas that come through and we kind of started the conversation with that, that like, you know, idea of ideas, but something like this to do a product, right? Was this something that was super strategic? Now that you have 45 people working for you, was this kind of something that they brought to you? Like, how did that happen? This was something we always wanted to do in some shape or form. I think we had toyed with the idea of a wine or, or something else, but we've, we've done, I mean, we have served, there is, it's funny because all of the, this seems sort of anecdotal, but we do, as we've gotten older, the business has matured, are very data driven as well. So we have surveyed our audience and what are they, are, I think it was 97% of our audience are drinkers. Um, and, you know, vodka and tequila are the two largest categories within that. Um, and obviously you have a changing world of, of canned cocktails and spike seltzers and just the, mm-hmm. the way that people are consuming alcohol is different and it made sense for us to be in that space just because that's what our audience is doing. And that's what we are. We always say like we are an extension or our audience is an extension of us or we are an extension of our audience. I don't know which way it goes. Um, probably depends on the topic, but these are kind of what we do, where we're doing, where that's how we like to connect to our friends. That's how we, even as founders and friends, when we're going out together, when we're we're in person, when we're having a, a meal, when we're having drinks, when we're really connecting, that's bringing us together. And again, it's an opportunity for us to laugh at ourselves. And I, you see on the back of the cans, there's little examples of faux pas um, in a way that kind of um, allows you to laugh at yourself. So <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah, just this vodka soda and it says this refreshing vodka soda contains hints of Chris Mint and Meyer Lemon, secondary flavors of rage texting the ex who ghosted you add a layer of complexity. <laughs> so it's again, it's really um, much very in the vein of we're going to laugh at ourselves. Yes. We do, we have these social faux pas. We're not perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the community element, but we can laugh at ourselves. And at the end of the day, we can hopefully grow, but also it's not, nothing is so heavy. Yes. I started taking seed about two and a half years ago, and my digestion has never been better. Not only my digestion, but everything connected to my digestion. I've noticed an improvement in my skin, uh, in my immunity. So, how often I'm getting sick, it's very, very few times during the year. Um, And I'm just so, so impressed. I actually was not taking seed for about four months. I just kind of fell off the train and noticed a difference. I started to get my little breakouts and spots that I normally would before seed. And so I knew it had something perhaps to do with it and it's all connected. So I would love for you to try Seed. Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic is the real deal. This is a broad spectrum two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic. It's a proprietary formulation of 24 distinct probiotic strains in scientifically studied dosages. And what I love about Seed is they are all about the science. You can read about the science on their website. It's pretty extensive and incredibly interesting. This is a two-in-one capsule, as I said, and it's awesome because it survives through your digestive tract. That's how they designed it. Most probiotics just kind of lose lose the juice um, and don't survive your GI tract. So seed is designed differently and that's why it works. So I would love for you to try seed. It will support ease of bloating, healthy regularity, and ease of evacuation, if you know what I mean. But it will also support your gut barrier, skin health, heart health, and micronutrient 
synthesis. Start a new healthy habit today. Visit seed.com slash almost 30 and use the code almost 30 to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 daily symbiotic. That's seed.com slash almost 30 and use the code almost 30 at checkout for 20% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 daily symbiotic. That's seed.com slash almost 30. Code is almost 30. If you could go back, would you do anything differently? Like, would you take a business opportunity? Would you have written another book? Would you have started taking other handles? Or like, what would be anything that you'd do differently along your journey? Hmm. Started your coaching earlier? Any ideas? Maybe that. I think the, um, because the founder dynamic is so important. Um, And it, again, it takes a certain level of vulnerability to say, we can't just, you know, and that's kind of true of therapy too. It's like, I could use some help in this. And I think becoming vulnerable was almost what changed the business and changed the content to be more vulnerable, to be less. It's because if you look at it from back in the day, it does feel a lot more, I'm putting up a wall of confidence to pretend like I, again, I know everything, Mm -hmm. but you really don't know anything. And I think part of, it's funny to see the business evolve with the three of us where we had a moment where like, okay, we don't know everything. We might not be communicating in the most effective way. Let's bring someone in to help us reach our true potentials individually, but also together. And I do think, and again, it's not overnight, so it's not like this one thing helped everything, but I think it was that combined with us also just becoming our own people. And that's a big thing you see as you leave college, you kind of have this group mentality. And then somewhere along the way in your late 20s, or, you know, whenever you get to that point, or your your 30s, you're kind of like, all right, I have, I'm not just part of the herd. I haven't, I have an individual vision for myself. And how does this tie into the company that I'm creating or whatever content I'm putting out. And that was definitely a maturity thing, but it's interesting to see how it just plays out almost side by side with the evolution of our business. It's huge. Was there anything that came up that you were like, damn, I didn't know this about myself or I didn't know this about how I was as a leader or how I was as a co-founder? Like anything that surprised you from your coaching that you were like, whoa. Um, you know, it's funny. We've done we've done employee surveys of us. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love <laughs> that's your nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, literally. <laughs> it is my absolute nightmare. <laughs> because I think we have done it and I just don't read it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm good. <sighs> yeah. I mean, that those are scary because uh, they're scary. anonymous. So it's like people feel free to, to which is good. Yes. I think it's good. And that's almost like the best ego check you can yep. do is how do I think I'm coming off versus how am I actually coming off? Um, and it's nice when it's when it feels close. <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. But there's always things to work on, and I think there's, and then I think a large part of becoming who you want to be or who you are is looking at those things that are. Fl- some people would say flaws or things that some people don't like, and then you have to evaluate: is this something that I want to embrace and? kind of just accept that this is part of who I am and and not try to be like everyone else? Or should I be trying to improve on this thing? Or should I be taking myself out of my comfort zone and trying to, and not just saying this is who I am, but instead trying to get better? And I'm still not totally sure. I think yeah. as, I, as I go through thinking about those things, a lot of the, I remember a lot of the feedback was that I was not very friendly or that I was, you know, maybe standoffish or aloof. Um, and you guys were like, yeah, we got that vibe. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, mm. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Which, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm self-aware enough. I would hope to, to realize that, yes, I can come off that way. So then part of me in my head is like, should I work on becoming friendlier and sweeter yeah. and more warm and just, but then another part of me is like, you're never going to be that, that person. I don't know yep. if you could be that person. Um, and like, is that woman specific feedback? Mm-hmm. Right. Where I don't know. Like, yeah. If you were a man, I don't know. You know, I'm, cu- I'm curious. I don't know. I'm curious if you would get that as much mm-hmm. where I think with women, there's the assumption that you are going to be super warm and super, you know, all of those things. But I feel like it's also energy. Like, I don't feel like your energy is standoffish. I don't feel yeah. like your energy is closed so it's like there is that like oh you know like hey that kind of thing that I'm I'm more like but it's like if your energy is 
good and welcoming, then it's that kind of fit. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm going to have to ask on the, John, let's make a note for the next survey. Yeah. Just say like, how hey, is the energy? Yeah. Be like, my energy, <laughs> yeah, literally. They're like, yes. if you, if you perceive me to be standoffish, but how's my vibe? <laughs> like, what's the vibe? Taking into consideration vibes, would you say? <laughs> exactly. That I'm that. Yeah. I think when we've done it, it's, I don't think I've been surprised sometimes, but I'm not really surprised. And it's kind of a relief that you're like, oh, you see what I see mm-hmm. or you know what I see. And mine's more like, um, just kind of always like moving people on to the next, like being controlling is like my okay. thing is like controlling. And it's like in an interesting way. It's not, it's not like I, I, I'm the master delegator. I delegate everything. I don't care about delegation, but then there's a controlling energy of how I operate mm-hmm. that's felt mm-hmm. where it's just right. like, what's everyone doing? Or like, you know, like, <laughs> but that probably serves you in some way. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's why it's so hard because these qualities, exactly. which again, subjectively positive or negative yep. can one, maybe one person it offends, but the other person is motivated by it or yep. the other person yes. feels, you know, like they're more productive because it, so that's why personally, I just find it's so hard to tell what, yeah, you know, that's, I'm sure, with a lot of feedback. Like, you probably get a lot of feedback. You have a huge audience and huge, huge community. And especially having a huge social media presence and, you know, with the blogs previously, like, how have you been able to take feedback from your audience or yeah. from random people or from trolls or whatever? Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, it's funny because we, we've been talking about this a lot lately because I read all the reviews for what? every show that what we put out. What the heck? Um, which everyone advises against. The internet is always a fickle friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. One day it's your best friend. You're on top of the world. The next day, everyone hates you. Um, so mm-hmm. it depends on what you're believing. But um, I try to read them because I do think if there's consistent feedback, I'd like to know it. My biggest fear almost, and I think in career or my personal life, is an emperor's new clothes situation where everyone sees it but me, I think, you know, I think it's great and it's going amazing or what I'm doing is perfect. And everyone else yeah. um, kind of thinks it's it's ridiculous. So that I mean, maybe that's probably part of why I read the reviews. I don't care that much about each individual review, but I do think as an aggregate, I like to not feel like I'm delusional about anything mm, totally, I'm doing. But maybe totally. that's my own no, I lack that. of confidence in that in that way. But I think we'll... You know, what it sounds like is that you're able to like pick up on something that could be true. You know, like Mm -hmm. I think you are incredibly self-aware and like, for example, in the beginning we said like, and totally, and all these things so much. We probably say like, hell yeah. a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Just kind of these phrases and way too much. How did you stop doing that? Um, awareness. We have each other. Definitely still say like, but not Definitely as much. still. I think when you take this sounds so like I'm gonna sound like the biggest douche, but it's like when you take your craft seriously and you listen to yourself and then you hear yourself saying like, you try and make the concerted effort mm-hmm. to not and say slowing it. down. Slowing down is good. But, but we sounded unbelievable. Yeah, I mean it was wild, but we had a bunch of reviews yep, that said, right. love the show. But these girls say totally way too much or something like that. And even though it was like mm, hard to hear, right? it was true. I, I was could like, like my read that right. and be like, uh-huh, mm-hmm. you're right. <laughs> so they are helpful. Yeah. But what's frustrating is that, you know, I think there was a period there. We had a few audio issues mm. on a few episodes, maybe like a we year ago. We were in ago. a closet. Oh, any year No, ago. like okay. a year ago. There was okay. like audio issues and people were like, love the podcast. The audio issues are killing me, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, you love it and you didn't talk about it when you loved it. But now the audio <laughs> issues are causing you to write a review. Yeah. Just email us. Yeah, literally. You know, just if you believe there, I just was like, you're going to use this as your opportunity for the review. <laughs> like, right. Right. We got it. At least give it five stars. I know. At least, you're going to yeah, love the you just really say love the something. Com- <laughs> right. Well, it's funny because that's that person's um, almost issue. Mm-hmm. Is, you know what I mean? Imagine how if they're giving feedback in the rest of their life. If that's totally. how they're giving po- feedback to your podcast, everything is so reflective of the individual. Um, but I have to, I, I should get tips from you guys because I've been doing this podcasting thing more than five years. And it's still so hard for me to just uh, not say words that I'm not supposed to say. I know. Or that I don't even hear myself saying and of then course. others hear it. And that's, 
That's the worst. But I've tried a few things. None of them have really What did worked. you try? <laughs> I tried an... Uh, like electric shock. <laughs> I want to try that. I feel like that would probably be the most effective. Uh, I've done a vocal coach. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, but I don't know. It didn't really uh, do much. So... But we have the sign behind you. It says, stop saying like, oh my oh, gosh, that's that. amazing. But also, <laughs> it's also the, kind of your brand. Exactly. That's There's true. this whole thing too, you know, where people, it's like people want you to sound like you're talking to your friends, like you're hanging out with your friends. They want that relatability. They want that approachability. And then they're like, stop saying like, and you're like, I'm talking to you. You know, right. if, I, if you were talking, I'm going to be saying mm-hmm. like all the time. So I think if you have that, this many hours of audio, you are going to be saying like, you're going to be you know, very true. Speaking mm-hmm. how you need to be. In these last few minutes, I wanted to kind of pivot towards more of like personal. You give a ton of advice mm-hmm. and it comes from experience. Um, but I know that during this, you know, period of 11 plus years that you've gone from being single to in a relationship, married. Um, and a lot of women in our community are they find themselves in that season of kind of limbo between relationships or they're, they've been single for a while. What would you, what would you say to those women um, or men really in their single season? Like what was really impactful for you um, to do, to focus on, to think about, reflect on before entering into your now marriage? committed relationship. Sure. Yeah. That was, I think one of the toughest life periods for me was that period in my twenties after college and before, um, I met my husband that I was dating a lot of people. And I think, I mean, to be honest, I think I I have the you up podcast, which is an exploration of, of datings and relationships. And the reason I've always been so interested in relationships is because I never really knew what it looked like to be in a healthy one. I had parents who were divorced when I was pretty young, always hated each other, still, still do. Um, and my mom had a lot of marriages to a lot of different guys. None of them really were, were lasting. And I saw a lot of like chaotic relationship energy growing up. And I wasn't, so I think as I was getting older, especially even as we were starting Betches and I started at 21, 22, a lot of it was thinking, okay, what does a, a relationship look like that's healthy, that is good, that's nurturing? Um, and I think in the beginning, I had a lot, and you see that in the very beginning Betches content, a lot of it, very bad ideas, very <laughs> things that didn't work that were a lot of like rules and game playing. Like what? Like, you know, never texting anyone first mm-hmm. or, um, you know. Don't waiting, reply for four hours. Or exactly. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> waiting a certain, you know, timing the, the, the amount of time that you you waited before you had sex with someone or any of that stuff. I mean, you could see it everywhere. There's still a very much alive and well on a lot of TikToks or advice or things like that. And I think at that age, I was like, okay, a good relationship is when you're in control, when you have the power. Mm. And that was always a thing in my mind. I was yeah. like, I, I never want to feel powerless or that I am like a victim in this situation yes. or that mm-hmm. I am the one being dumped. So the best way to do that is to just not give anyone any (laughs) verbal Mm -hmm. affirmation or not be vulnerable and kind of wear that as like a badge of honor. But I think as I got older, I was noticing that that wasn't working for me. I was, I was dating a guy on and off who was never committing to me. And I thought, you know, I, I still have never told him how I felt. So I felt I had more power and it's dragged on for, I think, six or seven years where it was on and off. You never told him how you felt? Not really, no. I mean, it was like, uh, or if I did, it was like very subtle or not very direct or very, you know, it was like more of a withholding thing. It was like, I'm Mm. upset with you, so I'm not answering you. It wasn't a, I'm clearly communicating how I feel. And I think I thought that was making me more powerful and some weird. um, That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think I got to a point, I think it was my 26th birthday, um, where we had been, kind of sleeping together all summer. And then it was my birthday and he texted me at like 6 p.m. And it was happy birthday, all lowercase. No exclamation. Like, how dare. And I was like, we've been sleeping together all summer. This is the worst message I've gotten all day. Like, and then I was, this this is my 26th birthday. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be doing this when I'm 40. Like, (laughs) I'm going to be, I can't be 40 just waiting, like, I'm, that's going to be, that's my worst nightmare. I need to do something to change this. I need to get out of this 
this rut of this hole that's clearly holding me back. And no one can really get you there but yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I started going to therapy. And I think a lot of it was unlearning the things that I felt when I was a kid were the way to be in the best relationship or the way to have a good relationship and really learning that a lot of that stuff wasn't serving me or maybe it served me when I was a kid, you know, trying to survive my chaotic family. But as I've gotten older, I don't need to be like that anymore. I can be vulnerable. I can say how I feel. There are people out there who will be um, receptive to that, who will want to date me for me and I won't have to put on this act of not caring and all that stuff. And a lot, and that was, it's funny because it seems like it would be so quick, but it was, it was years um, that it took for me to unlearn all of that stuff. And it's a very slow process and it's definitely not linear. I definitely went back to being with this guy um, at different points within that session, but it's really kind of slowly chiseling away at that to the point where I felt like I deserved someone who was good to me and nice to me and there for me. And I could recognize that in a person and was able to spot that and stop doing sort of self-destructive habits. So that's sort of the, I guess, the long version of, I love it. of that yeah. question. That's yeah. incredibly yeah. profound. Yeah, the control thing. And that's what's the withholding for control. And I can even relate to that, you know, trying to always maintain control a relation in a relationship for fear of abandonment. So sometimes I will withhold like affirmations or withhold like deep expression of love because it feels like a risk, even in like mm -hmm. friendships or even in relationships at times when it's close, it can be like that. So that's really powerful. Um, did you ever have a conversation with this person to end the relationship? Like how did that relationship end? Um, it ended in, I mean, it's funny. It, it, it never, <laughs> it never ends in a, in a almost like clear cut yeah. division way, but, um, it ended, I would say a year before I met my husband, when I had, I'd been working on in therapy, finally saying what I felt. Um, and we were like talking again and we were being, we were like friends, but we weren't going to be doing anything. Cause I, I said that it wasn't, I wasn't able to do that. Um, and then we, we were drinking and it almost happened. And I was like, I think you like me. I think you want to date me. I really like you. And I, I've never even said that so clearly. I really like you. I think you really like me. I feel like we should, we should date. What's the worst that could happen? It doesn't work out. Like we should do this. And he agreed. And then we dated for three weeks. And then three weeks later, he, he was like, yeah, he called me and he was like, I can't do this. Um, and I was like, well, why not? He's like, I, d I don't know. I just can't do it. I feel very anxious. I, I, I don't want to do this. And so that for me, that was like the last time that mm -hmm. we were together, that we had slept together, that anything happened there. And it's funny because you think like by saying how you feel and saying what you want, to me, like to an outsider that might look like I, that was a bad move. Right. But it's funny because by doing that, I set, I, I like set myself free Yes, because it, I didn't get what I want. And so at that point I was like, okay, I, I laid it all on the table and it didn't work out. And now I know exactly what, like what happened here. And so I can close that door. Yeah. Two avoidant attachment styles. And I'm sure when you're changing your attachment style where you're like, Actually, I want to clearly communicate. I want to call out what we've been doing for seven years <laughs> and yeah, say, totally. I like you. Like, yeah. And then it's like, oh, I'm anxious. This is like, it's like, thank God. Because it probably would have been the dance for yeah, however right. long you would have allowed it. And yeah, the attachment styles has been something that's been so crazy powerful for me just to even realize in that situation, you know, what could be potentially happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, the attachment styles were, that was a book that changed my life. I think it's yes. called Attached. I'm, you yes. guys have, have, mm -hmm. have read it. I've, I've never read something that related to me more. And I remember reading that and I was like, okay, this is, this explains a lot. And then how do I, how do I take this and how do I use it? And I think a big part of that book is like, we are social. We do have needs. We don't need to deny that we're social creatures, that we pretend that we don't need anyone because that's just not true. Um, so that was a big part of how that 
ended, but even even after that, he would he still kind of like lurked in. Of course, which is that's sad. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, now I can look at it again, like yeah. as, as less of a. And I think going through therapy with that, eventually he he came to one of my shows. Actually, my like live shows, mm-hmm. and he showed up. And it was like, I had already, I had my boyfriend. He texted me that he showed up. And then I was working with my co-host, Jared. And he like helped me craft this text message, which was really laying it out on the line. Like, this is not okay. Um, I don't like, don't like, we like explicitly saying what was going on. When you explicitly mm-hmm. say what's going on, it sort of, it, it pokes a hole in any yeah. sort of like weird, yes. magical flirtation, whatever thing. The dance or whatever it is. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that was really um, the last time that I had spoken to him, but it, it was very freeing to be able to, to say what you want. Part of me almost wishes that I could have a full, real conversation. But I think if he listens to my show, he probably already knows. Yeah, yes. probably. I know all I of our exes kind of yeah, yeah. know what's up if they've listened. I don't know if he could have a conversation. You know, sometimes people right. just want to stay in the unconscious phase of like, we're going to do the dance. I'm going to come to the thing. You might see me, you might, you know, and just if you're very clear and direct, and saying, this isn't okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I see what you're doing. You're here on my show. I We're not together. It's like scary. Right. You know, for people in that situation. Totally. And I think the bigger thing that you learn in therapy that I went through and after, even if, if after that conversation was not a question of why does he do this? Yeah. And I think a lot That's of people say that, like, why are you doing this to me? And the bigger question is one, why do you do this at all? Because it's not personal. What yeah. this is what this person does. And two, it's more about the question that you ask yourself of why did I allow this to happen for so long? Why did I, what felt so good about this relationship mm-hmm. that clearly was not like an emotional, like loving thing? Why did I stay in this for so long? That's the much more interesting question. I think so many people want to find closure with the other person, but really it's much more about closure with yourself yes. and figuring out why you put up with, with whatever the way you were treated was. Exactly. That was the turning point. Yeah, I want to do a podcast episode on closure because last thing, it's like people, like you'll never get closure unless you give it to yourself because you always have this script of what you wish they would say. Right. You're like, oh, I wish they would be like, you were the most important, you know, you were beautiful (laughs) and magnetic and all these things. They will never say your script. Mm -hmm. Ever. 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 And it's like you have to, I remember that so many exes, I'd be like, I just want closure. It's like, no, I wanted more. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted more of whatever yeah. was going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, more of the drama. Yeah. yeah. Cause um, that's kind of fun. Fuck yeah. That's the thing. And I mean, yeah. you guys are now back both in the married, day. So I'm sure mm-hmm. like that's everything's a trade off. Like mm-hmm. you get mm-hmm. stability and love and feeling safe and feeling like home. But what you don't get is like the drama. A lot of really yeah, the exciting up and down. Yeah, literally. <laughs> What have you, speaking of marriage, what have you learned about yourself and about partnerships since getting married? Oh, I've learned so much about relationships since um, almost being in a relationship, in a, in a stable long-term relationship. And I guess marriage just kind of feels like a slight extension of that. But I think what you learn is, because everyone, when you're single, you're kind of like, you're the star. And so you you think everything that you do is right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then being nothing like being with someone for a long time to be able to figure out yourself and, you know, obviously flaws in the way they interact with you, but also the way that you interact with them just because you've been doing, you both been doing what you've been doing for so long. So have being in a, in a long-term healthy relationship is almost like having a little bit of a mirror put up to your own actions and the way that, that you act. Cause that's someone who's with you every day. Yeah. Um, so I've definitely learned a lot about the way I communicate. <laughs> and what is, yeah, what is, what is that? Like, what how do you, you communicate? Yeah. yeah. You um, I think I, again, I was very prone to not communicating, but then having stuff build up just inside me, like slowly to where, and then a big problem that I had in the beginning of our relationship, which still pops up from time to time, although I am still working on it, was when I would drink. If I didn't, if I didn't clearly say what was on my mind or if something was bothering me, and even if it was a small thing, it came out in the worst way. Mm. Um, so something that I learned was if something, you know, to, to not hold anything in, to say it, well, to hold it in when you're drinking, but to not to say it before you mm-hmm. get into that, um, that phase of mind, mm-hmm. because what's coming out is the stuff that you felt scared to say or that you didn't feel was receptive. But once you feel like you can trust someone, once you feel safe with someone, 
you should say it when it happens because then it's then it's an easy thing to get over. Then yes. you can just work right through it. But if you don't say it and then it's just like this little tiny hint of an idea that's in the back of your mind and then it grows and grows and then it comes out in a way that you didn't want it to come out. Because whenever you talk about anything, if you're drinking too much, it always comes out in a way that's, I would say most people, if they were sober and looking at the way that it came out when drinking was, it would not yeah. be something, it would not be the way they would want to present their case. Yes, totally. Yeah, yeah it's like Been you there. have your point and then you have the, all the shit around your point. That's like, cause you're like, no, this was true and this was not. Like yes. the name calling wasn't, the truth was in this thing. <laughs> Me talking about this, what, you know, so it just becomes such a mess. So that's huge. That is huge. Well, I've loved hanging out. I've yeah, loved our conversation. Truly. I loved being on your pod. It was so fun. Your sister's so cool. Oh, thank you. I mm -hmm. love her. It was just, I think I love all therapists. Yeah, That's totally. what I've realized is like, I always like leave a conversation with a therapist. I'm like, I love that. I know, it totally. Like, just because they're a therapist. <laughs> and they like, I love that energy. Um, but this has been incredible. And we've always been so impressed with you and everything you've done. It's just mm. like, it's really, it's really, it's really cool. Thank you. And likewise, I love yeah. the community you guys are building. Thank I'm a, a huge fan of the show. Well, thank thanks. you. Thank you so much, Jordana. Again, you can listen to us on Oversharing right now. Thank you to Bitches Media. It was so much fun to connect and go into the office. Yeah, thank you all for listening. And thank you to our sponsors for this episode. We vet all of our sponsors for you, use them and love them ourselves. So we would love for you to check them out. We have discount codes on our website, almost30.com, as well as in our show notes. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. We'll see you soon. Hey, hey. Thank you.